Welcome to Breaking the Norm right here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. You've probably heard many stories of professional athletes, whether they're active or retired, going broke. They don't have any money left. They lost their money. Whatever their financial situation, we all get taken aback when big-time guys that we know, we know we've seen their salaries, we know that they've earned millions of dollars like a, a Tyson or an Iverson. It's all made public knowledge. Uh, and now they have nothing left. So today on Breaking the Norm, we're going to discuss how that happens, why it continues to happen, and what are some things in place or how that can change. You're going to hear from a financial expert. Uh, he's been in the financial services industry for over 25 years. If you recently watched the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary titled Broke, uh, he was featured in the film. It chronicled professional athletes and their monetary experiences. He's a frequent guest. If you've seen business TV, He's been on CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNBC, Fox Business News. I'm going to spit on another piece of paper probably here by saying so many of those. But if you want to hear from an expert about uh, finances, the managing partner from Chapwood Cap Capital Investment Management, Ed Butowski, is joining us. Ed, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Oh, well, absolutely. Uh, it's uh I I'm honored that you're here because this is so interesting to me. Now, Ed, before we before we begin – you know, I have a just under two-year major league career. And in my two years, I, I had a signing bonus of $2,000. I made less than $250,000 before taxes over my two years. I mean, my major league minimum my first year was 108000 I think in the second year it was like 119 or 114000 or something like that. So just a little bit of money, and, and to some it's not a little bit of money, but considering the topics and the people we're talking about, it's a very, very small percentage. And so in doing the research, Ed, in, in so many different places, you hear different numbers. And the number that is consistently out there is that 70% of retired athletes are broke. Is that an accurate number? And if it's not, what is closer to the accurate number of retired professional athletes that don't have money left? Yeah. And, and, and again, thank you very much. And, and I, I love the subject. It's something that uh, I've, I'm very passionate about. And that statistic comes up all the time. And, and that number, uh, you know, is questioned by many. The number came out of a USA Today article that was written back in 2002. And uh, the gentleman who gave that quote, you know, there, there was nothing to completely support that. Now, I actually have numbers that uh, are a little different, and I can support my numbers. And it's, it's really easy. If you take away the top 10% of professional football players, and I'm just focusing on football players, the top 10% of wage earners, about 90% of the rest are in financial distress 10 years after they finish playing. That's an amazing okay. statistic because and, you yeah. hear so many people say, well, if I had that kind of money, I would just live off the interest, live off the interest. And I know we're going to dive into why that doesn't happen, but that really is an amazing statistic. It, well, well, it is, but, but when you start to think about it, it's not that hard to believe uh, because they build up, and, and again, not everyone's like this. I mean, there are some people who don't fall into that trap, even if they aren't a top 10% wage earner. And some of the top 10% wage earners find themselves in troubles as well. And it goes back to a number of things. And when we first did this article in Sports Illustrated a number of years ago, it's called How and Why Athletes Go Broke. I'm the one that initiated that article because for many years, I managed money for, for wealthy people. And I had a friend of mine named Winford Tubbs, uh, who came over to me, he was my next door neighbor, and said, will you take a look at this? And I just took a look at it. I never pursued having an interest in managing money for professional athletes. Um, and I looked at what he had, and I said, well, why would you have this? And he said, well, we all do. We have stuff like this. And I thought, well, this is all private equity. And, and this wasn't only what Woodford had, but he showed it to me. And I said, why do you have so much private equity? And he said, because everyone invests in these deals. And I said, well, investing is not about deals. Investing is far from that. So as I dove more into it, I realized that we could solve this problem by simply communicating that, generally speaking, the reason people go broke, and not just athletes, but I'll focus in on athletes, is because they over-allocate too much money into private illiquid investments. Now, the key to this is these private illiquid investments, and meaning nightclubs, it can be car dealerships or just private businesses of any kind. Right. The majority of these investments, return zero, not 10%, not 5%, and you don't just lose 10% or you don't just lose 
you lose 100% the majority of those investments. So what athletes I found were doing was over-allocating into those and real estate because they didn't have a resource or a source to get them financial, basic financial investment education of what is a mutual fund, what is a bond, what is a stock. And 93% of the return of portfolios or on portfolios, and 98% of the risk comes from the architecture or construction, or an easier way of saying it, is the blueprint of a portfolio. And none of that was being talked to them about. And these are not dummies. These are some of the nicest, hardest-working people, and you know that because you've been around them your whole life. Right. They just, they just want to take care of their families. They want to do what's right, and they need to have a way to understand that. So we have the blind leading the blind when it comes to professional athletes. And one of the reasons I called Sports Illustrated was, let's fix this. And that's when we did the article, How and Why Athletes Go Broke. And then that gave rise uh, to the, the movie that was just out called Broke on ESPN. One of the things that you were quoted as saying on that 30 for 30 special was that you had mentioned that it was, quote, guys like you were, were yeah. part of the problem. And, of course, that's not yeah. you. But, but even, e- even as a 26th round pick... You know, first a 23rd rounder by the Boston Red Sox, elected not to sign to finish college. And then my senior year, the 26th round pick by the Kansas City Royals, which was not going to, before I even knew the number, I knew that it wasn't about a signing bonus. Um, it, it, it seems like even that late of a round pick, I had people call me that I had never, uh, how did they get my number? I don't know. How did they get in contact with me, even via mail or my school or something like that? I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know who to talk to. I never heard one thing about, hey, we need to begin a plan on investing your money. It was just all about you need to sign with me, and this is why. This is what I can do for you. And so tell me a little bit about the the what, what's it like out there because it seems like there are a lot of people. You hear so many horror stories about these people that are scheming money off these athletes or athletes aren't seeing their bills and guys are milking money out of their accounts. And some of the players even uh, reportedly know it, but they're so loyal to them and they won't change. So right. what, what's, what's, the, what, what's the situation out there with some of these guys that, that are, sh- are wolves in sheep's clothing? Yeah, it, it's, it's a good point because I think when I say that it's my industry – A lot of it, we have a responsibility. Um, All because somebody has money doesn't mean that 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 money comes along with a, you know, a a rule book on how to use it. In fact, I built, and I'll be happy to send it to you so any of your listeners can get it from you. Uh, It's called the Financial Playbook uh, because we list and make it very, very easy for people to understand. But money doesn't come with a rule book. For instance, I use air conditioning, but if my air conditioning breaks, I don't know how to fix it. Okay? I I use a refrigerator. Um, I don't know how to fix it if it breaks, and all because someone earns money doesn't mean that they should know how to do how to how to handle it. That's a great people, point. That is a really right. a great example. And the people in my industry are a bunch of people that you have to go back to. Really, you know, what is the source of the problem? And the source of the problem is a number of things. It's not the athlete's fault. It's my industry and the people that these athletes surround themselves around. Most people. Uh, there's a huge difference. I'm going to give you an example. Let's take a gentleman like Torrey Hunter, who's a wonderful baseball player, just signed a big contract. On his tax return, he puts down that he is a professional baseball player. Somebody who's playing single-A baseball, riding the bench on his tax return, puts down his profession as a professional baseball player. Right. Well, there's a world of difference between a Torrey Hunter, a world-class athlete, and um, somebody who's in the major leagues earning a, a substantial amount of money, and that person riding the bench in single-A baseball. And I admire the guy riding the bench who's playing single-A baseball, but the point of this is they both put down the same thing. Well, in my business, not all financial people are the same, and there's little pitfalls here or there, and it all goes back to clarity and people in my industry explaining and teaching. But here's the problem. People in my industry make a lot of money by keeping people not knowing Keep, yeah. They make a lot of money keeping people in the dark, okay? I, I actually formed an acronym called LOID, L-O-I-D, Lack of Information Dividend. And the less people know, the more someone is able to take advantage of them. So it goes back to the education. And what I do in my business is I focus on educating people and not their agents, not their friends, not their mothers or fathers, but those people. 
I got a call from a, a, a top draft pick, a, a top 15 draft pick last year's draft in football. And he said, can you please talk to my lady? I said, well, I don't understand what you mean, your lady. He said, well, this lady, she takes care of my stuff. I said, you know what? I will pay to fly out to see you. I will sit down with you. I will not give you my business card, but I will teach you what you need to know. She can sit there, but I will talk to you. He said, well, I'll see if I can make it. I said, well, you know what? Then you're not going to see me. I said, well, okay, come on out. I sat down with this guy for two hours. I've never called him again, but he now understands things. And I, I have the ability, and I've done this for a lot of years, to be able to explain the message very easily and succinctly so somebody can take it away. People in my business need to do a better job at that. And the training in my industry is a whole nother problem that people need to understand. Because my, the people in my industry are not trained properly, and there's a world of difference between top financial people and people who are cold calling and trying to find athletes at bars after football games and basketball games. There's well, a big difference. So Ed, then my next question is, how do these athletes know? How do they know who's, who's the top people and the honest people and the people that will really teach them first and help them invest their money instead of just burning their money and stealing their money from them because a lot of the time you get some of these athletes that either come from absolutely nothing or even just average means and now all of a sudden you know I take baseball for example my signing bonus two thousand dollars some of these guys are instant millionaires even after all the taxes are taken out they're instant millionaires before either one of those metal spikes hits the professional turf or dirt they're millionaires instantly so how do they know who to trust if they don't have anybody in their family that knows somebody that they trust right and 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 you bring you go right down the path that, that i'm happy you're going down who do they trust they have to trust themselves and they have to get the, they have to learn and understand. And a couple of general rules where you hear about people stealing money. Financial advisors do. There's a couple of guys in Florida that are just horrendous people that should be in jail uh, that I know of. They have stolen money outright because they were able to get power of attorney from these people. Nobody should ever sign a power of attorney. If their agent tells them, all you have to do is worry about going out and training and getting in shape and I'll take care of everything else. You should find another agent because an agent's job, they sit down and they tell these young men, I'm going to take care of everything, your insurance, your cars, your house, all of this stuff. These are some of the greatest con artists of all time. They don't have any background in this business. This isn't something you pick up just like, you know, you, you pick up, you know, where you learn how to flip burgers. Managing money and managing portfolios is not something that you just pick up, you know, uh, you know, after, you know in an afternoon. And you have to evaluate how to trust people. These guys, I know some guys in, in New Jersey that uh, were referred, the, their clients were referred to them by their agents. These guys literally, literally stole money, forged signatures, and did a terrible job for them. And those, those guys are probably going to find themselves in jail. Well, their agents referred them. There's no way these ball players should have known better because their agents referred them. So the smoking gun in my business is the training programs. The smoking gun in this whole problem right now is the agents and the family members who don't know what they're talking about, but somehow have gotten these athletes just to trust them blindly. Right. And, and I'm going to ask you one more question before we take our first break. But you, you make mention that there are, there are financial people out there. They call themselves financial people that they just decide, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and do this. And, and that's an insult and a slap in the face to professional experts like you who get an education and continuously study and have an honest mind and an honest heart and have the athlete's best interest at heart. So, by the way, thank you for championing what's right and protecting all these athletes and people out there with money. And I so appreciate what you do. But I guess here's a question for me because you said, you know, this, this athlete says, hey, you need to talk to my girl. Or you'll hear an athlete say, hey, talk to my guy. I don't handle that. Is it really true in your experience that, and we don't, we don't need to name names, but are there athletes out there that don't even see their own bills? Well, of course. That, that's amazing to me. It shouldn't be because I'm a former professional athlete. But to right. me, I can't imagine living a life like that, even if I had all the money in the world. I want to know what's going on. Well, they, they should, but there seems to be some force field around them that repels knowledge. And the reason is is because everybody in my business sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher to them. And if we <laughs> if, but if we look, if, if, let's just say there's a company that's advertising. I know we're up against the break here, so I'll make it real No, quick. we're good. We're okay. But, Okay, let's say that there's um, an, a company that is trying really hard to uh, uh, sell their product. 
and their advertising spending a lot of money, but the message isn't getting through. Whose fault is it? The person they're trying to reach, or is it their fault for not crafting the message right? Answer is, it's their fault for not crafting the message right. Well, if you don't get through to these people, it's not their fault. You have to craft the message in a way that gets through to them. And there's many ways to do that, and that's one of the things I try to specialize in, is making things relatable and giving perspective to ideas. I was on the phone this morning at 7.30 talking to a, a client, a ball player of mine, a very well-known guy, and we were talking about uh, the physical cliff. And I explained it to him, and he said, why doesn't everybody understand that? And I said, I, I don't understand why everyone doesn't, but it has to do with how we communicate. And if we communicate the message properly, we can get through to these young men because they are not dummies. You want to talk about tough stuff, read defenses, look at their playbook, and understand these gentlemen can understand things. We just have to do a better job of explaining it. Absolutely, and I think there's a little bit of piece of that in there sometimes, too, that some of these guys just get lazy. Now that they have money, they feel like they don't have to or they're never – you know, they're going to be invincible and they're never going to have to worry about that. And that's kind of where we're going to go in our next segment. So that voice you hear, Ed Butowski, managing partner of Chapwood Capital Investment Management. You may have seen him featured on the film from ESPN, the 30 for 30 documentary broke just on recently. If you haven't seen it, you need to get a copy of it. Uh, if you know of somebody or there's professional athletes around you or somebody in your family that is coming to some money or has money, but you don't know the things that we're discussing here on the show today, you need to check that out. And, and, and Ed, by the way, as we go into this first break here, uh, is there somewhere online, is there somewhere on the Internet people can go, your website, somewhere people can learn about the things you're talking about? Well, I... I... Some of the stuff, yes, we're redoing our website. I mean, you can go to edbutowski.com and see appearances that, that I have uh, from television and others. But um, most of the work I do and you know, most of my clients, you know, we keep their names out of this. Absolutely. And, um, but we do a lot of education. But I appreciate you saying that because uh, uh, one of the things I really pride myself on is the work I do um, is, is, you know, one-on-one. -on -one, and I just teach and I sit down and I take the time to, t to explain this. We are going to open up an institute uh, very soon. Uh, an educational institute for professional athletes on just this subject. Awesome, awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and take that first break. You're listening to Breaking the Norm. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Breaking the Norm. My guest today, Ed Butowski, managing partner of Chapwood Capital Investment Management. If you watch any kind of business television, CNN, CNBC, the networks, Fox Business News, Fox Channel, Bloomberg TV, China TV, he has been on there, featured on the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, Broke, just aired the other day. It's been aired a couple times, and I'm sure it will continue to air because comments and, and questions are flying all over the place. Ed Butowski is joining me. We were discussing the, the percentage of players that go broke and uh, the problem and some of these financial advisors that really shouldn't be financial advisors, some of these athletes who are really, really smart but don't know. You should never give power attorney to somebody. You should always know what's going on. I believe there was one financial advisor uh, talking about Mike Vick who was on that episode of Broke saying, hey, count your money. They were discussing what LeBron James, a, a guy like that, should do. Um, Ed, a friend of mine, uh, Danon Hughes, played obviously for the Chiefs in a, a year for the Saints. Uh, he has presented at some of those symposiums. And when we've talked in the past – Danon's told me as he's presenting of the two to 250 draft picks in there, if you talk to a, one, of the, one of the players, they'll say, hey, call my guy. He said they, and, and I think his quote was, they could care less about being broke until they're broke, and then they care. But I've heard there are guys in there falling asleep during those symposiums. So uh, well, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I mean, they, they do. Um, I've spoken to some, um, and, and, I, and I've seen a lot of uh, these athletes who have, um, you know, really not had a big interest in this until you finally get their attention. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a gentleman come to my office. Another ball player brought him to my office, and he's sitting there and he's leaning back. He's six foot five, three hundred and fifty pounds. He actually broke the chair. Um, <laughs> wow, little him. guy. Yeah, and I said, I said, you don't want to be here, do you? He said, no. I said, well, let me ask you a question. If somebody walked into your house and took fifty thousand dollars of cash out of your top drawer if you had it there what would you do he said well i'd shoot him and i said well what would you how would you feel if somebody who you're going to lunch with and calling your friend is taking two hundred thousand dollars in unnecessary management fees out of your account well i said so do you want to listen to me he said yeah let's listen 
the I'm ready. Yeah. Okay? And you know what? That's the way you have to approach this so somehow it evokes some sort of emotion. These young guys that show up, the problem is almost every one of them has been out, you know, either partying the night before, not sleeping, and, and I've given speeches to some that listen intently. I've given speeches to those who haven't, and you've got to get through to them in, a, in some way. If they show up and they're falling asleep, you know what? There's only so much we can do, right? I can control what I say. I can control what I do. I can't control what they do, but I can control the message in a way to get through to them. When I speak to these groups, I go to every NBA team around the country. I don't give my name. I don't tell them who I am at all. I don't want them to call me um, because I'm there to do one job, and that is to give them a 45-minute message, and that message is how to never go broke. And, um, and that's what we do. So you know, you're absolutely right. Some of these young men have these attitudes because their parents are taking care of it or their agents taking care of it, and we've got to find a way to shake them up so they listen because you know, within a second, their careers are over and they're out of work. Ed, you, you alluded to this a little bit in the very beginning, but I want to repeat this in case somebody's just joining us in the second segment here, but it's a two-part question. Part A, what are some of the most common mistakes these players make and how they lose all this money? But the more important question is, what can they do to avoid? What is the smart investments, in, in your opinion? What, if all of a sudden I'm from a below-average, below-normal-income level and I'm a big-time draft pick, I'm a first-round draft pick, and I'm signing for $5 million in bonus – a five-year guaranteed, $105 million contract, and taxes and all that doesn't matter. That's still a lot of money. So what are the, what's, the, what's some common mistakes these guys make, and what are some things they can do to be smart about not letting this kind of thing happen? Sure. Great question. I'll make it very, very uh, uh, direct. Until you have, and I'm talking to a ball player, $3 million saved after taxes, you do not invest in any private investments, meaning nightclubs and T-shirt companies and restaurants and any businesses, and you don't invest in any real estate with the exception of your primary home or if you want to put a down payment down for a parent. And that's only until you have $3 million put away. After you have $3 million put away, you are able to take 5% of your money and put it into those private investments, but break those up into 10 different investments. So if you have $3 million, you're allocating $150,000 to private investments, and you break that up between five and ten different investments, averaging between fifteen and $30,000 per investment. Because most of those investments, you don't just lose a little bit of money, you lose 100% of your money. 90% of private investments that people make, regardless if you're a professional athlete or any individual, returns zero. Wow. So that, along with one other thing that I put together, and I put it up on uh, the web, it's free. No one signs on to it. You go to www.chapwoodfdc.com. And Chapwood is the name of my firm, but FDC stands for Financial Distress Calculator because it's private equity and real estate, along with overspending, is the main reason that people go broke. So I put that up there. No one will ever know that an athlete goes to it, and any individual listening right now can go to it for their own, you know, their own sake because they can learn something from it. But you put in how much money you have, you adjust it for your cost of living increase, which is not the government CPI, which is Consumer Price Index. You put in there about six or seven percent because that's how much your money goes. That's how much it costs you to live next year versus this year. You better make six or seven percent to stay even when you include taxes and food and energy and insurance and everything, and you put in what you make today what your expenses are, how many years those expenses are going to last, you'll click a button, and it will tell you how many years based on what you put in there until you go broke. Talk about, Ed, this the bankruptcy, because there's a lot of players that are forced to go into this because they didn't do exactly what you told them to do. They didn't take the time to understand it and learn it and plug this in and debt-to-income ratios and all those things that go into all this. You're the, yeah, I, well, you talked about refrigerators and, and air conditioners. With what you do, you're the professional. So if my finances break down, I'm calling you. I'm not trying to fix it myself. But, right. again, uh, a lot of players are, are forced to go into bankruptcy. What are the pros and cons of that? Well, the, the, the point of that, and I'm happy you brought it up because I, I want to, you know, address it again. The point about the refrigerator, the analogy I was making is people like to laugh and make fun of these young men, um, and there's no reason for that. We should reflect on ourselves and, and say how in the world and why should these young men, all because those numbers are big, 
should they know how to take care of their own money if they haven't been taught properly? And, and all because they have money doesn't mean that it comes with some sort of rule book on how to use it. The analogy I made was with the refrigerator. I use the refrigerator every day, probably more than I should, right? But um, I, if my refrigerator breaks, I don't know how to fix it. I call somebody. And we need to educate people on how to manage their money better. Now, bankruptcy is an unfortunate thing. We're going to see more and more of it based on a slow economy. But we're going to see more and more of it if we, my industry, doesn't do a better job of educating people about how to manage money based on what I just said a second ago. Bankruptcy is really a last, uh, you know, a last resort, but I'd rather have somebody go and file bankruptcy than go out and take exorbitant risk because that's the next step. That next step is when people have uh, get to a point of pain financially, they end up doing things illegally. We saw this with Nate Newton down here in, uh, where I live in Dallas. Nate Newton, professional football player, having money troubles, and he started transporting drugs as a result. You mm. see other people maybe getting involved with other situations. Some of these people, unfortunately, get to the point where they're so competitive and they don't have money that they take their own lives. And, you know, they overinvest in private equity. They don't have money to be made. They don't want to live that kind of life. And, they blow, you know, they, they, they blow their money. And before you know it, they're doing things that they wouldn't want to do. So bankruptcy, I'd rather them go into bankruptcy than go out and do something illegal. Right, or end up, you know, ending their own lives, which affects not just them, but, of course, their families as well and their kids, uh, you know, on down the line yep. and a lot of troubles that go with it. Herm, Ed, Herm Edwards was quoted as saying the smart, the smart guys already knew what they wanted to do when they got done with football. Something like that, if you get a guy that kind of has an idea that, yeah, I'm still playing – and especially, you know, you use the professional football example. That is such an unpredictable thing because one hit, you're, you, everybody wants to play 10, 15 years and get fully vested. But one little hit, one little freak thing obviously can end it. We've seen it time and time again. Careers, guys retiring in their 20s. That, that, that statement, retiring and 20s, should be at opposite ends of the spectrum. But in pro football, that's the case a lot of times. And so do you find, Ed, that, that some of these guys, that at least if they go into it, have an idea of what they want to do later, does it get them a little more budget conscious or, or conscious in the sense of how they need to save and manage their money on the front side as opposed to waiting until it's too late? Well, it, 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 it does. And one of the things I'm, you know, as I look at my life, one of, you know, besides my children, one of the things I'm proud of that I've done in my career is really elevated this discussion. I mean, my article in Sports Illustrated, How and Why Athletes Go Broke, was really the, the seminal piece in this discussion. And then the movie now, uh, Broke, has really helped catapult the subject again. And when you do that, we have people now requesting to learn and have more knowledge. Herm Edwards is right. The, the smart people know what they wanted to do when they were done, but, but that's, just, that's just not true. I mean, you know, some of these people have an interest in something, and what athletes should be doing is using their celebrity status to gain access so they can learn. And I encourage most of my players, whatever city they're living in, to go learn about business. But don't use your own money because that's private equity. Find a way to utilize your name, utilize your skill set, your marketing savviness to, to find a way to increase, you know, visibility uh, and, and your knowledge so when you are done, you have something lined up. But these careers, you know, especially football, they're, they're cut short real quick, and their contracts aren't guaranteed. And, and, and if I was to, you know, kind of list the players who have the greatest financial problems, it is absolutely your football players are top on the list there. Um, and the ones that do the best with their money are the baseball players. Most baseball players might get a good signing bonus, but most of the baseball players, their careers – take a long time before they get to the major leagues. They've rode the bench or, you know, not just rode the bench, but they've, uh, uh, you know, for a long time, but they've rode the bus. And, and it's taken them a while, and they've worked hard. And they've learned how to live with very little. So base, bas baseball players handle their money the best. Football players handle their money the worst. And basketball players, you know, they tend to have a lot of money, but their careers, you know, are, you know, sometimes much longer than a football player. Okay, my last question, I'm going to let you go here. I appreciate your time so much, Ed Butowski, uh, Managing Partner, Chapwood Capital Investment Management. We're about halfway through the NFL season, and right. coming up next June you'll have uh, – and they've made pretty good concessions in these signing bonuses for young baseball players, but still the top guys, the one or two top picks because they've, they've reallocated money and how you're allowed to spend it on draft picks. So right now you've got a Division One football player that if he stays healthy – 
He's going to uh, make a lot of money at the end of this season. You've got a guy practicing right now, uh, right around now, to get ready to go on a spring trip, or guys in the south that are still playing that late fall season, getting ready for the spring and summer season, because they always do in January, February, to get ready for the spring-summer season. June draft comes along. Before they even get, if they, if they have an idea that they're going to be one of these top picks, what should some of these young athletes or all of these young athletes be doing right now, even before the draft starts, to prepare themselves for the money that they probably or maybe will have an opportunity to make? Well, I look, I mean, self-serving, they should sit down with me for 45 minutes and they'll never go broke if they do. But what they really need to do is view their careers as, especially in football, at about three and a half years. And view, so they have to think of themselves as being 56-year-old men. They're going to try to retire at age 60 and not overcommit. Many of them start thinking about how they're going to overcommit, how much money they're going to spend on this and that. I mean, you take a guy like Des Bryant, you know, as I said in the movie, who spent $56,000 on a dinner. Well, that's $110,000 prior to taxes and paying his agent. That's about a tenth of his entire, you know, contract. Wow. Um, so, so stop thinking about what you're going to spend. Learn how you're going to invest it because there's a famous rule, and the rule is called 72. If you divide 72 by a rate of return, that number will tell you how many years until you double your money. So if you grow your money at 10%, you'll double your money every 7.2 years. So if you have $100,000 in 7.2 years, that'll be 200000 In 14.4 years, that'll be 400000 And in 14.4 years, a lot of these gentlemen will be 34 years of age, and that's not so bad to be able to have for every $100,000 that you didn't spend potentially have 400000 Not to and mention those, they're young enough that they could continue to let that go for even another seven and a half years because now they're only going to be in maybe their early, you know, their, their 40s. You got it. And, and 800000 Yeah, and, and if right. they can wait one more time until their 50s, now they're $1.6 million. That's a pretty good retirement. That's exactly the point, and that's a simple message that we need to get through to these people. I, I tell my wife that all the time. She'll come home, and she'll say, oh, look at these shoes. And I'll say, how much were they? Because you know, that's what I do, right? I'm a, <laughs> I, that's what you go. And she says, well, they were only $50. And I said, well, $50 is 100 100 is 200 Do you realize that's $400 in 28-point law years? And she then she starts thinking about divorce attorneys at that time. Nah, tough living uh, with okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but you know what? It's a good situation. I'll tell you what, the, the, one, the, the, the people that I'm most proud of or maybe the most happy for and eventually the most proud of are going to be your children because they're learning from the get-go how to manage their money and what you teach them. They're going to have the opportunity to teach other people. So what you're doing, Ed Butowski, is a phenomenal thing, and thank you for being one of the – not just one of the international experts in financial investment, wealth management industry – but, but thanks for being honest because there's so many that aren't out there. You're a true professional at what you do, and you're making people's lives go in the right direction. And, and in the long run, that's just going to echo through generations. So honestly, thank you so much for the message that you're doing. And, and I know that as we set this interview up, uh, I found out that you really are passionate and love talking about this, and you have not proven one little bit short of that. Uh, so thank you, Ed, for your time. Cool. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. That's Ed Butowski, managing partner, Chapwood Capital Investment Management. If you've seen him on the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, Broke, uh, it was a phenomenal show. Uh, make sure you get it back to it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it'll come back around. You can find it on the Internet. He's been on CNN, ABC, CBS, Fox Business News, on and on and on. If you watch business channels, you are going to see Ed Butowski on there. So my thanks uh, to Ed for joining us. You're listening to Breaking the Norm.